Hey, good morning. Good morning. Great to be in God's house today. We thank God for a little bit of sunshine, which always makes a difference. And especially, we are so grateful that you are here. Uh, I want to call your attention to those who are helping making our web ministry and our live streaming possible, and that is Nancy and Bill Whitens in honor of the birthday of their daughter Helen and their son Ian, and Karen and Jim O'Brien in honor of Ruth and, and Rudy Lachelts for their 50th wedding anniversary, which they are now enjoying and celebrating with them for that family that was unsure because of Rudy's condition whether they'd be able to celebrate that, and so that's a... That's a big deal, and we're so grateful. Uh, we're so glad you're here. We're going to start worship a little bit different, just if you're not uncomfortable enough. We're about to make it a little bit more wonderfully uncomfortable. So what we're doing throughout, um, throughout June is uh, inviting us to break up in little eight or nine people to pray. And what I would like to know is if, uh, Mandy, I would call on you, can you come forward and... Uh, don't choose vision, but choose one of these other subjects. You can even call it out or just say, choose that one. Don't choose vision. We've already done that one. So. Which one would you like? Community. Community. So what we would like you to do is form little prayer groups. There are rocks that are going to be circulating in a couple of minutes to be with the group. And the way we think is we know some people are not out loud prayers. That's okay, right? Some of us like to pray out loud. That's okay. The rock will give to your group when you're done praying, either quietly to yourself or out loud, hand it to the next person in your prayer group. And then when it goes around, we'll kind of call everybody back up here with uh, Jesus, we are here, and then we'll sing our rousing opening hymn. But we're thinking during June, a great way to pray for our church, our community, our world is to, to be in prayer. And if you're uncomfortable praying out loud, it's okay. It's okay. We think started. So let's form little groups of eight or nine people. If you wouldn't mind getting near people, and if you want to stay there for the rest of the service, that's okay too. Father, thank you for our church. Thank you for this opportunity and surrounding here.
Good morning. Good morning. Let's turn to each other and say good morning and wish everybody a God bless October of uh, 2014, uh, Clarissa Crass has been traveling with Sandy Fultz and myself through the confirmation experience as she prepared for today. Now, Clarissa, I'm going to let them know that you probably had about four hours sleep last night. Yeah. <laughs> so, the emotion we hope is the spirit, but if it's not, we get that part too. <laughs> she was on a senior high trip, so as she ends her last year of senior high. Uh, but she's come to share her faith journey, and then we'll invite her and Sandy to come to the kneeler as we lay hands on her and ask God's Holy Spirit to confirm her in her faith and grow her as a follower of Jesus. I believe God sent down His only Son to forgive us and to make us who we are today, to make the world a better place to live. I believe Jesus died for us and to forgive our sins, to forgive us even when we are mad at someone for doing something we did not like and when we swear. I believe church is a place to talk to God and pray for the things that we did that we knew was not right and to forgive us and hope things get better. A place to worship and get to know more about God and what he did and what he was all about. God calls me to live a painful, successful life, to go to college, to be gay, to go to college, and just to me to go get my bachelor's degree in graphic design. To enjoy all the wonderful things in life, to enjoy all the memories that I have and to cherish them every day. To go out and do the thing into the world and do what I do best. To hang out with my friends and family to, and cherish the ones I have with them. To have a job that I love and to do the things that in the world that I love. <laughs> to know my first mom is there watching over me. <laughs> to make sure I do the right thing. <laughs> and to live my life to the fullest and be strong and faithful in all that I do in life. <laughs> Let it go. Let it flow. You're a long family, like you said. And feel me, please. Wake up, Mom. Sandy, would you come stand right here, please? And just have that so in case I need to relook at my notes here. Um, I, I want you to stand for a moment, if you would, please, Clarissa. And um, I want to ask you some questions first. And um, this is what we ask all persons as they come to an understanding of the work of Christ in their life. And, and to ask you on behalf of the church, do you, Clarissa, renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you repent of your sin, the evil powers of this world? And do you repent of your sin? And Clarissa, do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you? To resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms in which they take themselves. 
And do you, Clarissa, confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Will you put your whole trust in His grace and love for you? Will you promise to serve Christ as your Lord in union with the church that Christ is open to people of every nation and race and age? Please kneel. My hunch is, Clarissa, is you were a baby when you were last baptized. And I'm not going to baptize you now because you only need to be baptized once. But what I want you to remember in your spirit is the power and meaning of the baptism that was given over you so many years ago. As you were invited into the life of Christ, as you were encouraged and surrounded by God's love to grow as a disciple, as a community of faith, both here and other places surrounded you and truly have nurtured you to this place for your family, which has been a vital part of your growth as a person as well as a follower of Christ. And so, Clarissa, I say, remember your baptism and be thankful. Knit your heart with mine. Clarissa Marie Crest, may the Holy Spirit of our living, loving, and forgiving God work within you. That having been born through water and the Holy Spirit, that you may live now as a faithful follower of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, pour your Holy Spirit upon this your child. Grow her in your grace. You have walked with her to this place and now the future is wide open for her. Lord, we pray that the call of your life on her heart would grow big and deep. We pray, O oh God, that she would see that her place in the world is not to go as one who is served but in your name to go as one who serves, to be a light to the nations, to be salt which seasons the whole world, to be the very presence and love of God for those who feel loveless, to be food of faith for those who are lost, O oh Lord, to be the presence of Christ, the love of Christ, the forgiveness of God in lives and hearts and homes that feel so devoid and loveless. May your Holy Spirit do something powerful with your child. Grow her in grace. In the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Clarissa Crass, as a member of this congregation, will you be faithful to the United Methodist Church? Do all in your power to strengthen and support its ministries. And if you do, say, I do. And as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gift, and your service to continue to show others what life in Christ can both be and become. Members of this household of faith, I commend to your care, to your love, to, to one who's a fellow journeyer with you in the life of faith, Clarissa Marie Kress, a member of this congregation, but even more important than that, someone who says, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Will you welcome her? Now, we've had the privilege, Sandy, of having you join us on this trip, the untold hours. By the way, last Thursday, we went to play laser tag last Tuesday, and I uh, Sandy played, yeah, <laughs> Clarissa won them all, I but uh, <laughs> Sandy enjoyed the game, didn't you? We had a great day out. This is also a reminder that you, too, are called to be a servant and not to serve. That is so real in your heart. We thank you, all this whole congregation, for the time you have spent in walking with Clarissa through this journey. Thank you so very much. By the way, there is cake afterwards and celebrations. <laughs>
girls, come on down for our time this morning. And I got a little picture thing I need you to help me do this morning. Okay. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So I have a, a thing here which has a picture on it. and So here's my question to you. What does Jesus look like? <coughs> Any ideas? What does Jesus look like? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? What's that? He's got like a white robe, all right, so I'm going to try that here. You know how good I am at this, so be careful, right? You know, he's got one of those robes, some pastors wear them, right? Okay, so he's got a white robe. What else does Jesus look like? What do you think? He has a circular head. Beautiful. You're right, thank you. That is so true. So we'll give him a neck, too, to go with that. Is that circular enough, or should it be more of a circle? More of a circle. All right. Sorry. I'm not a good math person. How's that? Better? What else? What else does Jesus look like? He's got hair. Long hair. Unlike me, right? I, I used to have a ponytail one time in my life, though. Can you believe that? Yeah, I'm not going to do Hard to believe. What else? He's got legs and feet. Now, his knees are probably in here. We'll pretend, you know, those little knock knee kind of things. You know. Sorry, Jesus. Nothing personal. All right, so then he's got feet, right? What does he have on his feet? Shoes. He's got sho jogging shoes. Is that what he said? I love that idea. I bet you, no one knew Jesus was a jogger. But he did cover a lot of territory, so that makes sense. All right, so what else does Jesus have look like? He's got what? Flip-ons. All right, well, we'll put those over here in case he wants to put those on. How's that? Okay. What else does he look like? Right, he's got hands coming out. Let's see, we'll, we'll give them like that, right? And we'll put his hands kind of up, right? Because he's just thanking God for God's love, right? What else does Jesus look like? He's got ears, thank you. And that's probably underneath the hair. And what else does he have? He's got ears, he's got to have eyes, right? So he can see us. And a nose. And is he, and what? To smell us with? <laughs> How about what else? A mouth. What kind of mouth? Is he a smiling mouth or a sad mouth? He's Because, right, because he's happy. Because he's serving God. Beautiful. That's what kind of what Jesus looks like. It's our interpretation, right? I'm not a really good artist, so. But let me ask you this. How do we know, how do we know what Jesus' love feels like? We see what it looks like, but how do we know what his love feels like? Anybody have an idea? Because he's happy. That says something about his kind of love, doesn't it? <laughs> Helping each other out. That's perfect. Jesus said something really interesting to his disciples. He said, as God has sent me, so I send you. So what he's saying is, God sent Jesus to love us, and now he says he wants you to go in his name to love others. So in other words, when we love people in Jesus' name, what does that mean? People might experience from us Jesus' love, right? So he's given us a big important job. God sent him to show us God's love, and now he's sending us to show the world God's love. So here's how I want you to do this. Before we walk out for Children's Church, I want you to hug two people on the way out. To let them know, show them God's love. Are you comfortable with that? Not everybody's a hugger, I get that. Well, you can shake a hand then, okay? To show everybody God's love. Can we do that? Two people, you can hug on the way out to show God's love. But before we do that, let's pray. Say, dear God, thanks for loving us. And reminding us. You give us a big job that we show others 
what your love feels like and what it looks like. Thank you, God. Amen. Sweet, sweet spirit together, but let's pray first. Lord, we ask that your hand of healing, your spirit of grace and peace to be upon Mary. Men, men, those broken places. We thank you for being with Wanda during these obviously difficult and frightful times through the surgery, and we are grateful for good news. We are grateful for good news. And we also pray for this, pray for this community of faith for our children and our teenagers. We pray that we might be difference makers for you in this community and this world. May we be a light. May we be salt at seasons. May we grow in our faith and be challenged to become even deeper, more meaningful, more life-giving followers of Christ. We pray that the example of Clarissa as she turns her life over to you again and again would be our example to you. That you make us, you create us, and always mold us into something more, something richer, because you love us. Lord, we pray in thanksgiving for your love that never gives up on us, and for that sweet, sweet spirit of your unending grace that comforts us and heals us, strengthens us, and makes us whole. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and all of God's people say. I want to invite you to think about two names and perhaps write them on your Lord. Who do you know at work or at home in your community, in your neighborhood that that needs to be embraced by a community of faith, that needs to know the love of God, that, that maybe you can begin praying about now to invite, to experience, not, not just church, but God. And to think about that name and write it on your bulletin, begin praying for them, and then when God creates the opportunity, invite them to this community, to a, to a worship service. We live in a world with, with a lot of deep and, and deep needs. And we know that the first place we begin to address those needs is in a living relationship with God who claims and loves us all. Who do you know that you can be writing down on your bulletin even now? Or at some point, maybe in the next 20 minutes, that you can invite, pray about first, and then invite them to the worship of God, to the experience of God. Let us pray. Thank you for claiming us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for healing in our brokenness. Thank you for hope in the heaviness of life. Thank you for, for Jesus, who gives us a living example of what your love is like, teaches us how to love, and then calls us, calls us to take that love into this broken world in need of healing and be salt and light. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, for, for you are our strength and you are our Redeemer. And all God's people said. Amen. So from the Gospel of Matthew, the, uh, the 28th chapter, verses 16 through 20, this is a uh, post-resurrection appearance of Jesus as the eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all the peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Have you ever had those moments in your life when, when you get done watching a, a, a news program on TV, one of the evening news, and or you become aware of reading the Valley News or hearing through Facebook of events in the life of this community that display a sense of brokenness and, and pain and hopelessness, or, or maybe out of your own life experience, and you find yourself asking yourself, God, God, we get Jesus was your plan A. You sent him to show us what your love is like, to offer us forgiveness, to, to help us uh, draw close to you. But he left, you know, he was resurrected, he ascended. So what is your plan B? You ever find yourself asking that question? God, what is your plan B for this world, for this community, for my own life? What is God's plan B? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All of God's authority, all of God's power has been given to him. And then what does he do with it? The very next thing he says is to his disciples, Go, therefore, and make disciples. Baptize. Teach them. Invite them to obey all that I have told them to do. He's given all of God's power and authority and he doesn't hold on to it. What does he do? He gives it away to you and to me. In John's Gospel, in another resurrection of Count Jesus goes into the upper room where the disciples are gathered and he says to them, God the Father has sent me and just as he has sent me, so now I send you. And then he breathes on them the breath of the Spirit and says, Peace be with you. That breath of God, which is formed over creation from the very beginning of time, which brought order out of chaos and renewal out of brokenness. And guess what God's plan B is? Us. Go, he says. All power and authority has been given to me. I give it to you. Just as God has sent me, so now I send you. Guess what, my friends? We are God's plan B. How does that make you feel? You can answer. How does that make you feel? Great. Great. I love it. How else? A little overwhelming maybe at times, right? Scary. Scary. I know. Me? But God, you know what I didn't do yesterday that I should have done. And yet God is choosing us to be the carriers, to be the plan B of God's desire for all of the world to experience the salt and light of the grace and love of Christ. We are God's plan B. And he doesn't just leave us alone. You know, he says at the end, he said, and I will be with you till the end of the age. But he also reminds us, you have these teachings that others have kept of how I was and how I invited you to live and to love and to, about when you run into people that you have an adversarial relationship with. They, they almost feel like enemies. How he said, pray for those who are your enemies. Or you see people by the side of the road or marginalized or disconnected or hopeless. And he says, go and be with them. People who are hungry, he says, go and feed them. People in need of hope and faith, he says, go and be the salt and light in their world, in their lives, in their sense of who they are. He invites us to be plan B. And to take the teachings he has given to us. And continue to let them grow and write them on our hearts. We are God's plan B. God's choosing us, inviting us, empowering us. So what does it look like when we're God's plan B? 
Before I answer that question, I want to kind of mention something very briefly about another kind of plan B I think that we often find ourselves struggling with. You know, that plan B in life, when, when you had a plan for life, when, when your life was moving along in a certain direction and, and it was heading in a particular trajectory and it was a positive trajectory and all of a sudden something happens to pull a rug out of that plan. And you find yourself looking not just for a plan B, but you find yourself looking for a plan C or a plan D or plan E. And you're asking yourselves, what is your plan, God? When you come home from work and the woman or man you have been married to says, I don't think I love you anymore. God, what's your plan? When you are called by the boss into the room at work and he says, I'm sorry, but we have no more work for you. As of Monday, we're laying you off. God, where is your plan in this? Or maybe you've had a medical event or someone you love has been in an accident and it's totally changed and transformed your life or you're in the middle of dealing with that and you find yourselves crying out, God, what is your plan? plan here. The Bible never says, never says, God does not let bad things happen. In fact, when you read the Bible, the very second story in Scripture is the story of Cain and Abel, two brothers who engaged in violence with each other. One killed the other brother. The very second story of the Bible is already a reality of our human condition in our life together. God never said He would not let bad things happen. But God does save those and deliver those who walk through the valley of the shadow of death. God is the God of the hopeless. God is the God of the distraught. God does help those who cannot help themselves. God does come to those who feel as if life has pulled the rug out from under their feet. And they do not know where to go. Psalm 18, the psalmist writes, In my trouble I call to the Lord. I call to God for my help. In His temple from on high... God heard my voice. He listened to my cry for help. And the Lord reached down from above and took hold of me and pulled me out of the deep and chaos of the waters. He rescued me when I was in trouble. The Lord protected me. He helped me out of danger and saved me because, because He loved me. Because He was pleased with me. This is... The God who always walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death to remind us that, that hell or the difficulty or the trial you are going through is not, never has been and never will be God's final story for you and your loved one. The breath creating, renewing, Spirit of God continues to blow and breathe. But when you're in some of those places, let us not forget that we are still moral agents. That we still can choose life or death, war or peace. And the scriptures remind us to choose life. We can still exercise that God-given dominion as described in Genesis chapter 1 to make positive choices. And sometimes, sometimes those positive choices may not seem like much for the moment, but you add them in positive life-giving choices even in the middle of difficulty, of faithfulness, even in the middle of struggle. And they begin to add up to a life that shapes character, not just your own, but the character and witness of those around you. When you ask God, what is your plan B? God invites you into community. One of the things I keep discovering about myself is I grow best. I grow more aware of who God is in the community of my brothers and sisters. The power of small groups. 
The power of gathering together just to study and pray is not about getting through the curriculum or the material. It's hearing how God speaks through the voices and experiences and spirit of others that both challenges me, refreshes me, comforts me, and invites me to grow. We become more of our best selves in the community of faith than we could ever be by ourselves. <clears throat> Difficult things happen in life, but they are not God's plan. They do come as opportunities, though. As opportunities to choose life and faithfulness and to seek the counsel and care of those who love and can pray for you and with you. Now that question, you know, what does it look like if uh, if we discover we are Plan B? Let me give you a couple of examples. Let me give you the example of a of a place in in South Africa called Moy Moy Pius. It's a it's a village. It's a ranchack shanty town village in the garbage growing garbage heat outside of Pretoria, South Africa. People, sixteen thousand men, women, and children make a living on this garbage heap as it grows. They use its refuge to build their homes and to and to sustain themselves. Literally, no water, no electricity, no sewer, and yet in the middle of this is this mission supported by the United Methodist Church and other mission agencies that. They've taken the building and renovated it, and 240 kids are taught every day about God, about how to take care of themselves. They're taught skills to grow in life. And just, just outside the door in a, in, a, in a kind of cleared away area, there's a garden growing in the middle of a garbage heap. So that some of those people can have healthy food rather than what they end up finding in the garbage all around them. People pushing away the darkness to share light. Or maybe an example of how we are called to be Plan B is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a cab driver in Denver, and he takes people all over that growing metropolis. And when he was asked about what is God's plan B for your life, he says, I feel I am called to be a cabbie. Not a rescue mission director, not a, not a uh, mission relief agency. He's called just to be a cabbie. He says, because I feel I am called to spend my time with whoever comes into my cab and share light and God's grace with them in whatever way I am presented. Pushing away the darkness. Casting the light. How about you? How are you God's plan B in this community? When I think about the challenges of our community, the economic challenges we all talk about and reflect about, the economic challenges of which are still a part of our very own lives, I thank God for you. Because I realize you are God's plan B in this community. When you find yourself asking that question in the midst of all of this, God, what is your plan B? God says, it's you and it's me. So let your light shine that all can see. Be salt that seasons the whole love. That we may continue this masterful work that Jesus is with us on pushing back the darkness and bringing forth the light. Who is God's plan B? It's you. And it's me. All God's people say. <laughs>
cake and other goodies as we celebrate today's confirmation, but also the study on prayer begins about 11, 10, 11, 15 in the library. Go in peace. You you are, Jesus said, the light of the world, salt, salt in seasons. Go in peace and may the hope and joy that is in you be shared with all around you and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen.